right, so we're transitioning here from the creatives to the nerds and the geeks. So, and the nerds. And so uh, uh, I know uh, Chuck's got a very steeped history here in this town. So I've lived many stories back in those days. Uh, this topic is called practical IP. So uh, for those of you who are wondering why do I transition my facility to IP, um, what is involved, um, this conversation is, I think, going to revolve around that. So, uh, Kent, the floor is yours. Who's, oh, there's, there's He's behind you. You're going to stand here. Hi, everyone. So, thank you for joining us. We've got a full panel today, so we've got a lot to cover in 30 minutes, and we'll try to keep this on track and cover a lot of useful information. But uh, my name's Kent Terry. I'm the chair of the Simply San Francisco section. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Sports Media Group and uh, ASG and the other sponsors of this event for putting together a great event. And on behalf of SIMTI, particularly the San Francisco section, we're happy to be partners in making this event happen. So we're happy to put this session on. So this session, we're talking about practical IP. And let me have an overview of what we mean in the context of this session. Um, we thought about doing a deep dive into some of the technical issues, and we certainly have the guns to do that here. But we thought what would be most beneficial to this audience was to talk about practical issues that people are facing when considering the move to IP or when you're getting into IP. Now, if you're already in place with that, you're already in the process of moving to IP or you've started implementing it, you're probably aware of many of these issues already. But particularly for those of you in the audience who maybe haven't made this transition yet, and you're either considering it Just barely. or you're being asked by your, your corporate sponsors to <laughs> look into IP uh, for a solution to replace your existing baseband SDI facility. What are the issues you're going to face? What are the practical things? So we're going to try to cover three, maybe four general broad topics that are some of the key pain points we see that you're going to face when you come onto this. And that's what we're going to kind of focus on today. So I've got a great panel. We've got uh, Nick from ASG and, and Dion from Sony. Angus Matrox, Chuck from uh, CS Meyer. Thanks, Chuck. He's got a long history in the industry. And Ryan from Arista. So, steam group of panelists, and we'll try to get to everybody so everybody can have a comment on what there is. So, the first subject we're going to tackle is number one subject, which everybody always talks about when moving to IP, and that is money, cost. What is the cost? We're going to say, is this saving me money? Is this costing me money? What's the deal? And we kind of broke it down in a generally three main areas that you're going to face when you're, when you're faced with this. One is uh, justifying the upfront cost. What is the upfront cost if you're, say, doing a whole field translation from SDI to IP as your infrastructure? What's the cost compared? Cabling, routing, all that. Uh, the second is the operational cost. What is it, how does it impact the operation of your facility? What cost goes there? And the third is how this um, translates into it is what is your network going to, your system going to look like in five, ten, ten years? So that you could say, we have an upfront cost, but we have a cost savings or a cost expense in the next few years that's going to impact this. You have to factor in all three of those when you're considering this, this transition to IP. And fully realizing that every facility may be all IP, very likely you're going to do a combination of IP and SDI, and there'll be components of it. So depending on your system and what those components are, it could affect this. But anyway, to start off this discussion, maybe I'll start with you, Chuck, just say, what is the upfront cost <laughs> compared to SDI, and maybe how does that relate to the system? We're going to talk about system components, too. I know you're big on the whole system, but just give us an idea what, what somebody new to this is going to face. Um, some of the typical numbers based on some of the installs, it could be maybe 10 to 20 percent more if you just say, I'm going to go buy an IP solution. Um, as, as, uh, Kent was mentioning, though, there's some holistic ways to look at it. Um, Nicole, who just stepped out, but she was here in a session before, I thought she said it perfectly. What is your long-term product you want to produce? And that's what dictates everything else. And so if you take that reverse approach, not I'm going to take the shiniest new technology and build something, but I'm going to look at my long-term ROI on my investment and where I need to scale in order to provide my end product that I make money, then you're going to get a more comprehensive analysis. So it's, uh, you know, I can do, the, I can throw the dart, and my history is such that those of you who know me, I just uh, penalized myself. But um, take a look at the holistic, take a look at the long term, is my advice. 
And Ryan, you, with the RISTA, you know, you make the routing equipment, you know, compare just an example of cost. Are users facing, is that the biggest impediment or is that really not the impediment to doing this since, you know, RISTA is such a ubiquitous networking equipment. How does that compare? Sorry, from a cost perspective, you mean, sir? Yeah, just an upfront cost. And again, not looking right. So the costs really depend on the kind of workflows that the various customers are going to be implementing. You know, levels of redundancy, levels of scalability. You know, do you want you know more modular kind of chassis, or do you want more fixed approach of chassis? You know, optics really do come into come into play here, and that that affects you know obviously the fiber runs, but you know, of course, cost costs. Part of me do come. You know, our, you know, it can obviously impact the overall cost, the, the, the network side of things. And we try to work with whether it's the integrators and the customers on the various kinds of topologies to kind of, to kind of limit that because it can fit within any customer's budget. It's just about finding the right kind of architecture that fits their needs, you know, spine leaf versus monolithic modulars that are supporting like you know 400 gig platforms 100 gig only or do you want to be ready for you know, do you want to be ready for 800 gig but there's a lot of different factors that go into it but selecting the right mo the, the right kind of switching platform the right optics you know we can find solutions that that fit any kind of workflow yeah i do i do hear some comments about you know the price of cabling depending on the ip and things like that but i i think there's a lot of that gets once you're into this, that really becomes part of the noise, uh, the cabling itself. But we do see simpl impl uh, simplifications in the infrastructure. So maybe, Dion, have you seen its systems? What have you seen with customers with systems putting together in terms of when they transition over from SDI to IP? Is it an upfront cost that's becoming more? And, and how does that relate to maybe scalability? No, I, I think you're, you're right, and, and Chuck hit the nail right on the head. 15 to 20 percent is about right. That's what you're going to see for costs up front. And I think as we go to the subject of the panel, right, practical IP, the practical conversation you're going to have to have with your leadership about approving your budget to convert your system from SDI to IP will have to be the ROI that you're going to get out of the system. So you're going to have to show that you're going to get scalability and flexibility out of that system that you're investing in. I agree with you. The cables and stuff, that's in the minutia. In the early days of IP in 2110, we were talking about, you know, reduction in cables, reduction in weight for production trucks. In corporate spaces or enterprise spaces, you don't have to worry about that. So you're really more so focused on how much more content am I able to generate as a result of implementing IP? So I do think the first considerations you're going to be looking at is your broadcast control infrastructure, your routing infrastructure, and then your video switching infrastructure. Those are prim primarily going to be the core of what you're going to be looking at for IP. I think there is a, a little bit of a luxury pricing attached to that right now for IP connectivity, but it is coming down because pretty much every vendor on the market right now is developing some type of live production infrastructure with support for, and we're using the word IP very ubiquitously here, but 2110, you're seeing NDI and other technologies, of course, come into play. But from a systems perspective, you start with your core, your router, your broadcast control infrastructure, your production switcher, because that's taking all of your signals, everything else, you can either have it as IP or you can do conversion, your cameras, your replay, things like that. Yeah, and I know, Nick, you, you talked some about scalability in a system and looking toward the future, say five, ten years out, where is our system going? What are our system needs going to be? And what have you seen with your customers and how they say, how you pitch this system, say, look, where you're going in the future, where your, your product is needed, how is this going to help you? What have you seen with your customers? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I'm uh, totally in agreement with Chuck and Dion, uh, you know, with their uh, uh, analysis, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what the upfront costs are. Um, you know, the, the, the key advantages for uh, uh, exploring, you know, an IP infrastructure, um, there are essentially two key reasons. So it comes down to flexibility and scalability, right? So depending on how you architect a network, you know, for a customer or for a project and uh, provisioning enough room for scalability and expansion, whether it's in, uh, you know, a, a, a allocating enough uh, ports for, uh, you know, on your spine infrastructure or, uh, you know, uh, expanding your leaf switches in your network topology, uh, depending on which way, you know, how you provision your network, the, the, the scalability aspect of uh, leveraging IP technology is uh, significant. Uh, you know, compared that to an SDI infrastructure where, uh, you know, you would have a monolithic environment and a finite, um, you know, IO count, you know, 
256 by 256, you know, 576 by 576, and so on and so forth. But with IP, I mean, it can all be asymmetric. Uh, and, uh, you know, speaking, uh, you know, a, a little bit technically, I mean, the, the, the codec that you use, whether it's 2110 or uh, JPEG XS or whatever, you know, format it is, that really is uh, encapsulated and packetized in your layer five of your OSI model, which is your session layer. Everything uh, downstream of that or upstream of that, depending on how you're looking at it, your transport, your network, data link, ethernet, all that is basically um, um, standard. So it, it, the whole IP uh, uh, transport mechanism is really agnostic to the type of underlying format that you use uh, in your plan. So, you know, from a scalability perspective, I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunities are, uh, you know, immense and uh, um, you can really grow, uh, you know, your system very significantly. Hmm. Okay, that's great. So the other factor in operational cost, and I don't think we have time to delve into it, but it's been discussed a lot in the industry, is you, the training for graffiti. If you've got traditional skills with SDI and baseband, how does that translate to IT? Well, there's been a lot of movement in the market, a lot of training, so I think that's become less of an issue, but I, would you agree that it's, you know, the, the, the operational aspects today that people are used to these systems are um, kind of equivalent that you train your engineers to work with IP systems and it's a kind of equivalent? Angus, you have any comments on that or any? Well, uh, <clears throat> you have a, a shift in expertise required from video engineers, people who understand video you definitely need networking expertise, you need IP expertise, you need IT expertise. So th that shift is, is definitely happening. There's an interesting thing though, which is if we look around, there's a little more gray hair in the room than fresh-faced young kids, right? So uh, they, the next generation of employees is actually much better informed about IT and IP and less about video. So it actually works, it got, kind of goes hand in hand. The evolution is uh, working together. We're replenishing from the bottom with new staff who are understanding this stuff a little bit better and uh, we get to mentor the outgoing ones, uh, uh, help them uh, get up to speed with, with all things video, so for sure. Now, uh, the point about scalability is really the thing. So when you look at the cost, you have to really assume and take for granted and understand that what you are getting is the scalability. So your calculations about how much work you can get done with your SDI infrastructure versus an IP infrastructure, they don't compare. You can just do more, I add more, I get more cloud, I get more CPU, I get more commodity processing or more commodity network or specialized as the case may be, and then I can do so much more with it. And if we want to talk about the practical side of that as well, then you start thinking about the different formats, standards, codecs. What is it that I'm going to choose to work with in order to support A, the infrastructure that I have in place today, or one that I can afford to put in next year or grow into or eventually uh, adopt as my, as my standard operating system? And I don't mean OS in a, in a computer OS, just how you, your, what your workflow will be. So this is, this is another important thing and there are a couple of codecs or standards or formats and these words are beginning to be a little bit interchanged now that, that, that you want to consider. So JPEG XS, for instance, is going to allow you to work at a much lower bandwidth. It puts a lower burden on your infrastructure to start with and you can dip your toe in the water and still get acceptable broadcast quality out of, say, a one gigabit connection. So there are a number of factors to think about. The practical application is, okay, well, how do I maybe crawl, walk, run as I build up into this and what are the formats that I'm going to use that are going to allow me to gain some expertise, some knowledge, some familiarity with the way to work and build out my uh, plant in the future. Okay. Yeah, and that transitions over to what you're interested in, Chuck, looking at this as system components, JPEG, codecs being one of them. So this transitions nicely. So tell us a little about your thoughts on, on system did, building blocks. No, no, I, I, I guess it's spot on. Um, and when he's talking about scale, um, there's another element that I think is important to consider and that's degree. So if I want to take a look at how I want to architect something for the future, I've got a scale factor, how many, how much. Uh, I have a degree, how deep, how wide, how high. And these things as we move to a more and more software enabled environment, they're going to become much more highly flexible. And you'll, you'll find an ability to say what today was 
I don't know, I'm old. An SDI embed or de-embedder is tomorrow's codec, be it JPEG XS, H.264, MPEG FF, so be, be what it is, format agnostic. Not only that, it's the format that you need to carry out the production because it's to the end product you want to have. This is what Nicole was telling us sooner. So the ability to scale and the ability to have degree or variance in that scale are going to be some new design tools as how we look at our total ROI. Yeah, and I know Dion, you've talked about the system components as well, particularly the codex and viewing these things. So what are your thoughts on that subject about, you know, it's particularly with the content you're dealing with because you do have to pay attention to what kind of content is flowing around our facility, what the resolution is, what number of channels, things like that. So share some of your views, Dion. Sure. I think, um, it goes to the heart of, again, the title is practical IP, right? We're using the term IP, but that is a broad reaching def term, right? And I think what's important for anyone who's considering looking at IP is one, I always tell people this, don't do IP just for the sake of doing IP. Do it with an end goal in mind. Do it because you want to achieve new workflows. Do it because you envision that your environment needs to support the same mixed formats that Angus and Chuck were just talking about. You want to mix 2110 with NDI, with JPEG XS, with HEVC. You want to look at IPMX, which I'm sure we're going to talk about a little bit later today. So you have to look at the end goal in mind. Just don't do it because you can do it because I know we're in like, you know, Silicon Valley. I say this in the corporate space and the sports space. There are small call letter stations out in the middle of the country that don't need to go IP, right? And I say that as the guy who thrives on selling IP. I want to be clear about that. You don't have to do it. But I think as you look at your total systems, as you look at building out your environments, you have to define what IP means for you, right? So for your production environment, and I'm just going to make these as examples so no one come after me for this, but for your production environments, maybe you do want to use 2110 for production. It's established, you know that there's devices out there from your system cameras, your production switchers that can do uh, 2110, NDI is operating in that space as well. You might want to use something for your contribution. How are you getting signals from your campus to remote sites? That's going to be a different kind of IP. 2110 is uncompressed. You might want to use something that's compressed, like a JPEG XS or HEVC or some other type of transport stream or transport protocol version of IP. If you're operating in the cloud, that could bring in another version of IP, things that have to be cloud agnostic that can go up and down across a pipe without having to pay your telco provider a lot of money. So as you look at your environment, IP has different definitions and different applications for what you're trying to build out. So you just have to look at what you're trying to accomplish and pick the right technology, the right format that matches and then figure out a way to make it all work together. That's going to be kind of your practical thought as you're planning things out. Yeah, good thought. So one of the other components that you're going to face when you're implementing systems, like I said, when you go to IP, you've got choices, and we're going to talk in a minute about the different formats and options there, but one of the things you're going to face as a component is routing and control. And that's been one of the issues, and particularly what system you go with and how that affects your routing and how that control, that's going to change from SDI. So I think you had some thoughts on that, Nick, about routing and control. Yeah, so it's really un uh, important to understand, uh, you know, how routing and control actually uh, 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 function, you know, and how they differ in, in a baseband SDI type of environment versus, uh, you know, a more, um, you know, uh, uh, IP based environment, right? So in an SDI based environment, you're putting in a uh, SDI based router and all the uh, routing functions, all the routing is actually handled or done or facilitated by the internal, um, you know, cross point matrix, right? Whereas, uh, you know, in IP environments, you're actually switching at the end point um, unless you're using, uh, you know, software defined networking abstraction, which I'm sure Ryan would love to talk about. Uh, but, uh, y you know, so that's essentially the key difference, right? So, you know, uh, it it's important to distinguish, uh, y y you know, um, um, uh, uh, you know, which, which routing mechanism, you know, works best for you. But then uh, one big aspect in, uh, um, you know, um, I examining the right solution is, uh, how does the broadcast controller communicate with all my endpoints and with my third party endpoints because um, uh, that becomes uh, uh, you know um, a crucial point of conversation so you know um, specifications uh, uh, you know from nmos uh, in terms of iso 4 and iso 5 really help with that uh, you know uh, 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 you know facilitating that control mechanism and directing endpoints to be able to switch uh, you know streams but uh, you know those are some uh, um, you know important uh, 
you know, considerations that one has to think about, you know, when, uh, you know, transitioning to IP. What kind of broadcast control system do I want to put in place? How do my endpoints uh, conform to NMOS specifications or other third party API integration or, you know, stuff like Ember Plus or something native? <clears throat> yeah, you, you from the uh, networking side, Ryan, you know, any comments on where you see the, the control plane fitting in and, and what, what users can expect from a practical standpoint when dealing with that? Yeah, thanks. So, you know, what Nick said is absolutely right. You know, you have to look at the right, you know, find the right broadcast controller. A lot of these, a lot of these systems are, all these systems, at least for on-prem kind of like local routing distribution is all done through, through multicast. And, you know, the, the broadcast controller system can easily trigger, you know, endpoints to do destination, destination based switching. You know, that works really well in IGMP worlds. But, you know, these systems are getting really large. You know, many thousands and thousands and thousands of large bandwidth, you know, large bit rates, you know, high bit rate video streams, thousands and tens of thousands of audio flows. Sometimes IGMP and things like that aren't good enough, really, to effectively route and securely route your signals from, you know, point A to point B, C, D, and, and so on and so forth because you run into you know, issues with oversubscription and things like that. So, you know, Nick referenced the orchestration layer, which, you know, that is something that I'm seeing a lot more of. You know, these systems are becoming smarter. They're able to handle a lot more, a lot more flows, hundreds of thousands of multicast groups being, you know, routed all over the world, uh, you know, all over the facility. And like that's, the, you know, tens of thousands is very, you know, it's very common now. And with these kinds of advancements, there are, you know, in, in control systems, like a broadcast controller, the same thing kind of is starting to happen now on the, on the network layer as well where we can route these kinds of signals in a bandwidth aware way and, you know, I'm of the opinion that like in an IGMP world, you know, in, in broadcast worlds, you know, tally is very important, for example. You know, people want to know when a route succeeds or if a route fails and what, if it fails, why does it fail? In some environments that's, not ex in incredibly possible. You, you know, you, someone just kind of fires off a command saying, hey, I want to join this stream and we rely obviously on the network to say that, hey, this stream or to route this stream from A to B. But with advancements now in various orchestration methods and SDNs, we can provide that kind of tally back to broadcast controllers so that the operators actually know when things succeed. And that's where I'm kind of seeing the advancements right now in these kinds of control systems, not just being able to say like, have a universal protocol that says like, I can control all of my endpoint devices with, you know, one protocol instead of having to write, you know, very specific drivers, but also, you know, you know, have a universal one and also get all of that, you know, network critical information like when do my routes succeed, when do they fail, why do they fail. So I think that's where we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of advancements right now in these kinds of systems. We could do a deep dive on that and get nerdy <laughs> real quick, but we only have a few minutes left. So I'm going to transition to our last topic we're going to touch upon. It's one of the big issues you're going to face as a new user. Okay, the format, you know, IP is IP, get your Ethernet, get your network going, but you've got to basically choose a format to go with, you know, 2110 being ubiquitous. But there's choices, especially choices today. You've got your NDIs on the audio side, you can choose standard AS67, you can go with uh, Dante, Ravenna, there's, there's choices on these sides and we need the considerations. But one of the new things that's coming out that may be of interest to the local users is IPMX initiative and how that affects it. Now IPMX is built on 2110, but it's oriented more to different focus. And I think Angus, you have some thoughts to illuminate us on where you might consider IPMX in a facility. Okay, absolutely, and thanks a lot. It's uh, very interesting. So all the topics that have been addressed in the previous sort of 22 minutes, uh, IPMX is looking to help you with. So IPMX is this open standard. It's created by Ames. It's a collaboration of a number of different manufacturers, VSF, and they have created the standard for IPMX, uh, IP Media Exchange, I guess, is what IPMX is for. And it's a very interesting format. First of all, it's built on ST2110. So it's got a very well-specced, uh, SMPTE-based standard as its foundation. And then it adds a number of capabilities and features that are going to make it very interesting to what we used to call the AV world and maybe now is bro corporate broadcast or just media production generally. 
and and it's really interesting. So one of the things about it is that it lets you choose the resolution. It supports up to 8K and beyond, so you're not restricted to a specific format. It also accommodates multiple color spaces, frame rates, and bit depths. So instead of being tied to just one broadcast standard inside of 2110, you can actually have a variety and maybe those say 444 sources are something that you really need to keep going in your facility for whatever reason if you're doing corporate or AV. So that's very interesting, allows you to have that all flexibility. It includes JPEG XS and as a result and many other uh, codecs by the way, allow you to run it on anything from a 1 gig to a 25 gig network. So IPMX uh, is very interesting for all of those flexible, scalable, I get to kind of choose my workflow sort of thing. And then it brings what a lot of the EV world wants which is missing from 2110 which is things like HDCP, so you get security, you get USB signals for true interactive AV experiences where you could have video in a conference room or something else and you're actually interacting with it and sending signals bi-directionally. So IPMX reverse compatible with 2110 as well as giving AV people everything they need and the different uh, bandwidths and format support. So something that's very interesting for everybody to start considering and uh, I happen to know that at Infocom next week there will be something like 30 to 40 manufacturers showing IPMX enabled devices. So this is a format that I think the crowd here in Silicon Valley will be very interested in and it's worth uh, exploring a little bit more and it's just IP video and that's another great advantage of this technology is that you get to choose the format, the standard that you need. Horses for courses, the right tool for the right job. So IPMX is just another choice for you. Yeah, and I like that IPMX is built on 2110, which is a solid foundation. Uh, any Absolutely. comments on 2110, Chuck? Um, no, not necessarily 2110, but I really want to reinforce Agnes's message. Um, to me, what he's describing is a parametric device, a programmable device. If we go back to um, ISO 405, I always felt we were a little deficient uh, when we did that work because we didn't open it up truly to a Kubernetes slash um, Docker oriented device. So we missed the manifest, we missed the description. I, I think we'll see more and more of this come to life. And, and, and what the beauty of that is for you is that if you've got a software endpoint or even a hardware endpoint that's based on GPU or advanced processing, those endpoints are going to have a life. And we talked all about at the very beginning of this, what's your total cost of ownership, what's your total life. And so as you need to progress your production technology in order to meet the creative requirements of your internal, external, and customer, this ability and flexibility is going to be anywhere. It's even going to be in the NOS of your switch. And to some degree I can go in there and mess around and cause routes to happen in a predetermined way if I wish. So all of these types of capabilities are the things that are enabled by this IP technology and this practical IP platform. So just, it's good stuff. It's really good stuff even though we're nerds. Yeah, and you do have choices. Um, you know, the, the IP in general is format agnostic and you can interchange, you know, you can mix multiple layers. You can have, you know, 2110 for your base video and mix it with Dante for audio if that meets your solution needs. So these are all possible. Now these are not simple changes, but it's very different than the SDI AES world where you have to rip out your entire infrastructure to make things happen. So it's an investment in the future to make this. And on that subject, we, we don't really have time to delve into audio, but definitely audio is one of the things you're going to impact in a facility is how you handle audio because it has its own special challenges. And um, um, Dion, have you seen anything that strikes, comes out as audio, the pain points people are having in terms of dealing with audio and where does something like a Dante or something come in and help with that? Yeah, for anybody who's familiar with implementing any type of IP system and remember the challenges that you had with PTP, audio is the new PTP. <laughs> I'll just phrase it that way. Um, and I, this is not a knock at the audio team because I do think, you know, even people consider it, we call ourselves video people, right? Audio is essential to any production because what's video without audio is security cam footage, right? It's, it's not very, but, and I think it's one of the things that get forgotten when you're planning out your, your IP systems, but it is very complex. So all of the signals and channels that you're looking to manage in IP, multiply it by 16 because it's 16 channels of audio per stream of video, right? And that's if you're only delivering in one language. 
So and it, that's not dealing with Dolby. That's not dealing with all of the other complex topics that deal with audio and each one of those streams is addressable. You have to account for it. You have to route it. You have to shuffle it. All of your traditional audio workflows still have to work in an IP realm. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I am saying it's challenging. So as the title of this goes, Practical IP, IP is practically impractical, <laughs> but it's a challenge, but it is a challenge that's worthwhile. You're going to go into it. It's not going to be easy. I'm not going to fool anybody on that. Video, audio for sure is going to be one of the bigger challenges next to interoperability and PTB is still kind of there and Chuck just went over some of the things with NMOS. But my final message to you all is that it's worth it, so please take a closer look at it and move forward. Yeah, and we're, we're sorry, we're about out of time. We've barely scratched the surface of this. Lots more to talk about. <laughs> Feel free to talk with myself and the presenters after the session, and we hope to follow up with another online session later for, for people to ask additional questions because there's a lot more to cover. But I do thank my panelists for joining today, and um, thank you for ASG and SVG for putting this event on, and uh, I'll let you go to your break. Thank you. Thank you.